What's up, folks? I gave a talk at our local Charlotte Metro GIS users group the other day on AI GIS, and I thought I'd share it here. When I do a talk that isn't being recorded from for, for the venue, I usually like to afterwards do it again and share it here in case anyone's interested, and also because my slideshows are hot garbage. They are just of no utility whatsoever. So just posting my slides won't, won't help anyone. My slides are mostly there, so you don't have to spend 15 to 20 solid minutes staring at me, because that's not healthy. That is, that's, that's not good for you. So let's jump right in. Artificial intelligence and its applications for GIS. I think we all know what we're talking about here. No, that's not what we're talking about. That's nothing like what we're talking about. I wish that was what we were talking about. This presentation would be so much more interesting and pertinent to your everyday life if that was what we were talking about. If that was the case, we could talk about pocket nukes and EMPs and recognizing cyborgs in a crowd. Instead, we're going to talk about training bots how to recognize pictures of cats. Life is not fair. Human beings have been interested in artificial intelligence for a long, long time. From antiquity, we've had myths and stories about people imbuing stuff, things, with intelligence and consciousness. We had the golden robots of Hephaestus, the Greek god of fire and metalworking. We had the winged Talos, that you can see on this picture, on this coin from 300 BC. Talos was a giant automation that would patrol the coastline around Europa and uh, three times a day. And if it spotted a pirate ship or a never-do-well or a douchebag, it'd pick up a giant rock and it'd fling it at it and you'd yell, douchebag! Although it'd do it in Greek, so uh, uh, it probably sounded more dignified. Ever since we've been able to build the simplest kinds of mechanisms, we've thought about what it'd be like to imbue those things with intelligence. Over time, these, things, these ideas about artificial intelligence move from mythology to fiction and science fiction. Here we have the original cover of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein from 1818. Cover art really sucked back then. The subtitle of this book was the modern Prometheus. Prometheus was the titan in Greek mythology that made human beings. He formed human beings out of clay and imbued them with consciousness thereby pissing pretty much everyone off. The Greek gods were quite mad. I don't even think the humans were very happy about that. And you've got, of course, iRobot by Isaac Asimov, a book everyone should read at least five times. This was first published as a series of stories starting around 1940 in his book in 1950. I highly recommend you read it. And the three laws of robotics should be somewhere on the citizenship test, so everyone should know those. Now, artificial intelligence really began as what we see now as a modern field of study in 1956 at Dartmouth College. There are inklings of it earlier. You had the Turing test in 1950. But a summer workshop at Dartmouth, uh, they came up with the term artificial intelligence, a lot of the concepts behind it. A lot of people in that workshop led the field of artificial intelligence for decades to come. Most of them predicted that within a single generation, we would have artificial intelligence that was just as smart as a human being. Well, that didn't happen. AI, as it turns out, is a lot more complicated than they thought it would be. Human intelligence is super complicated. If you look at the people around you, wherever you are, if you're in in an office or a coffee shop or on the bus or in jail. Just look around at the people around you and you might think to yourself, I could replace most of these people with a small shell script and no one would know the difference. In most cases, you would be wrong. People are a lot smarter than they look and they have to be. AI you can divide into Strong and weak. Strong AI and weak AI. Strong AI is what everybody thinks about when they think about AI. It is a human-like reasoning machine or even godlike intelligence like HAL 9000 or Skynet. We don't have that. We don't have anything close to that. That is not on the horizon. 
what we have instead is weak AI. Weak AI are algorithms that are made to solve very specific questions, answer those questions in very specific, well-defined problem areas. And that's incredibly useful. Uh, it's just limited. Think like a bot that uh, you teach how to play chess or Jeopardy, or a bot that can look at uh, x-rays and determine if there's a break somewhere. These are the kinds of things we can do with weak AI. It's incredibly useful, but it's limited. Now, weak AI can be further divided into machine learning and deep learning. Machine learning is what it sounds like. You're teaching machine how to teach itself. It learns on its own. So we give it some data and we give it some tests and the tests determine whether uh, the algorithm is coming to the right conclusion for data we know the conclusion for. And we let the algorithm learn the best way to get those right answers. The machine learns. Deep learning is also machine learning, but the way it operates is so different that we generally classify that as its own thing. You can hear deep learning called uh, a, a neural network sometimes, or a convolutional neural network. And the way this works differently is it's modeled after the human brain. It's a classification engine. When it gets input data, it classifies that data through a series of, of layers to go from more abstract to less abstract, very much the way a human brain works. So it's, it's very useful for particular kinds of problems. That didn't have anything to do with this talk. That was a desert rain frog. I just thought everyone needed to see that. Now, weak AI, uh, the things we can do with it, you can think of in two general categories, object recognition and predictive models. Object recognition is what it sounds like. You're recognizing stuff. You're recognizing a picture of a cat or you're recognizing words from a human voice. In GIS terms, you can think of that as like looking at aerial photography and determining uh, where's the rutabaga crop or where's the building footprint things like that. Predictive model is also what it sounds like. You're predicting unknown data based on known data. And uh, think of that like predicting what you might like to watch next on YouTube or what you might like to buy next on Amazon. In GIS terms, you might think of things like, I've got this air pollution sensor over here and I don't have any over here. I can take this air pollution sensor over here and look at all the other data I can possibly get about where those things are and make a predictive model to determine what the air pollution is where I don't have sensors or what the air pollution might be in a future state. So let's talk about how we build a bot. We're going to make a bot that finds cats, pictures of cats. Now, but we're not going to make that directly. Instead, we're going to make bots that are going to build that bot. We're going to make a builder bot and a teacher bot. And the reason why we don't directly build the bot that finds cats is that we're far too stupid to do that. Uh, the ultimate question to how does our bot recognize whether it's a picture of a cat or not when we have a bot that does that is we don't know. We don't know how that bot does that. It's not what it sounds like. It sounds creepy. They love to say that on TV and it's like, oh, ooh, creepy. That's not what that means. The human brain is limited in the complexity of a system it can consciously grasp. We can barely hold in our heads the phone support tree you'll have to go through when you call your ISP because your internet's out. The algorithm that picks out pictures of cats might look something like this and it's just too complicated for a human mind to put together what's going on there. That's what we mean when we say we don't know how it works, but that's why we build the bots that make the bots, not the bots themselves, because the bots themselves are too complicated. You can't get a programmer to make this. So our builder bots gonna make a bunch of student bots, mostly at random at first. Student bots are going to the teacher bot, 
and the teacher bot is going to test them and see which one is best at picking out pictures of cats. And that one will get a gold star, the rest will be brutally murdered. Now the gold star one will go back to the builder bot, and the builder bot will create more bots based on slight permutations of the winning bot, and it'll run the tests again. And it'll do this again and again and again. It might go through a thousand epochs. It might have 10,000 students instead of the five you see here. Until eventually you get to a point where you have a bot that really isn't getting any better. And then you have two choices. You can either say this bot's good enough or you have to go get more data to test with. That's why everyone's after every bit of data you, you produce. It's using that data to train the bots, train the algorithms. So I decided, hey, I'm going to make a convolutional neural network to find building footprints from aerial photography. How hard could that be? I, I went to college. Let me tell you something. It's hard. It's really hard. So I've got this 2019 aerial photography we just got in. We got that in, by the way, if, if you consume Mecklenburg data products. And it's flown leaf off, which uh, is helpful for finding building footprints. It's also ugly. It maximizes both of those things. So, and we've got some test data. So I'm going to build a neural network, a deep learning algorithm to find building footprints. And my computer ran that for like three days. And eventually, after three days, it can kind of recognize building footprints. Sort of. Not very well. Uh, my bot's kind of dumb. Three days without an NVIDIA card was, and the, the small sample of data I used was really not enough time to make a really good, uh, really good algorithm. So it kind of works, but you can see these are very blobby building shapes. You, you wouldn't like take that and go, great, post it to production. Uh, that would not be good. Now, some, some things I figured out along the way is uh, building a neural network, a deep learning algorithm, you really want an NVIDIA card. NVIDIA card has CUDA cores and it'll offload onto there and it'll run much faster. I had to run these on the CPU and that was, that was very slow. And after three days, I was like, hey, I got to play video games. And that was the end of the, the deep learning algorithm. So if you're playing video games on Linux, go Team Red, AMD. If you want to do AI stuff, go Team Green, uh, NVIDIA. So let's wrap this up. Most people are very down, especially in the media on AI. They say it's going, the AI bots are going to take all our jobs and sometimes even eventually shave, sterilize, and destroy us. And that's a very glasses half full take on this. I am much more optimistic. I think the AI revolution, and I, I think it will be big enough to be called a, a technological revolution, kind of like the internet and things like that. Uh, I think it's going to be awesome. I think it's going to be really great. I think some jobs will be lost, but other jobs will be created. And here's the thing you need to know about people on TV. If what you have to say is everything's going to be fine, you're not getting on TV. So some jobs will be lost. Some will be created. There'll be jobs we don't even know will be jobs will be created through this. But I think more importantly, we're going to get lots of great benefits from AI. We're going to have better medical diagnoses, better treatments. We're going to get better data. We're going to get better predictive models. We'll understand what's going on in our communities better. We'll be able to predict what will be going on in our communities better. We'll better understand the outcomes and results of complex systems when the government does stuff. For GIS, which really for data science, and GIS is just data science, uh, data scientists who get paid less. Uh, GIS in data science, it's going to revolutionize these areas. The things we do right now uh, are going to be very different going forward as machine learning algorithms become part and parcel of every time we analyze data. So I am very optimistic about the future of bots. And I think if nothing else, it's going to automate a lot of really boring shit that we have to do so we can think about more interesting problems. And that was the talk. 
I used uh, Tom McWright's Big for this, for the presentation. I tweaked it a little bit. I just added a couple little functions so when it gets to a slide with a video or audio tag, it automatically rewinds to the beginning and, and starts them up when the slide comes on. Uh, that was about it. And uh, I hope you found that useful. AI, let me tell you a couple things about that before, before I go here. AI is, when a new technology comes along, over time it gets abstracted. And by that I mean it gets easier to use. Some of the, the really technically fiddly bits will be, will be ironed out and you'll get a nice GUI and you'll, you'll have a big button that says do the AI thing and it'll, it'll just run. It's not there yet. You're going to have to get elbow deep in this stuff to really use it. So right now it's kind of hard and it might always be a little bit hard because it's not an elegant solution. It's very much a brute force attack on these kinds of problems. Uh, brute force attack you'll hear of in security terms that uh, rather than having some neat little hack, what they did is they looked at your password field and just ran 18 million words through it until they found the right one. That's a brute force attack. These AI algorithms, you probably heard from my description of them, it's very much a brute force kind of attack on these problems. And the reason why they work now is because our hardware has gotten so fast that they're practical. A lot of the ideas beside, around machine learning and deep learning are from 20, 30, and more years ago. Some cognitive model ideas were from around 1980. It's just, it's only now that our hardware is fast enough that these are practical solutions. But it's very much a brute force attack. And that doesn't mean it's a bad way to do it. It just means that's that's what it is. So it will always be a little bit complicated. And hardware, I, I mentioned NVIDIA. Uh, get used to Docker. A lot of these tool sets like TensorFlow, you can get on Docker and save yourself a lot of setup headaches. And if you really get into machine learning, uh, you'll probably want to look into some hosted solutions. There's uh, AWS and Azure both have machine learning uh, instances you can rent that have NVIDIA 1080s and 1080Ti's and maybe even 2080s at this point and you can run it there. Just remember to turn turn those those things off when you're done or your bill is going to suck and that's what I got for you. AI is a very interesting subject. It is a very deep rabbit hole and you can spend months and months and months going down and it's not quite there in terms of your daily GIS use but in the next five years or so, I think it's going to be there. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Hope you liked that. Have a great weekend. I'll catch you later. Bye-bye.